This morning, I hope to define for you the true blessing of freedom. The reason being that tomorrow we celebrate the 4th of July, our nation's Independence Day. And so I just love celebrating the 4th of July because I've used it as an opportunity to just slow down and be thankful to God for the nation that I was born into, uh, as well as the kingdom that I've been born again into. But the, the freedoms that I enjoy of being in this country are great. I've been blessed for 50 years, and I'm not one of those grumblers. I, I love uh, being an American. I eat apple pie, I watch baseball, I drive a Chevy. I love fireworks. I love and appreciate all those who have served and sacrificed for our freedom and some who paid the ultimate price with their lives. So I really think that that is what most Americans love and enjoy is our freedom, celebrating life and liberty and justice for all. So we have freedom and we should thank God for it. We should be a grateful people. We're the land of the free. What is interesting though is that we are losing some of our freedoms even as we speak, of the freedoms that we will celebrate. We're adding more and more laws to our country that give criminals and lawless people rights and freedoms and legislation against religious freedoms. I, I heard several more this week of just that are being passed that are demanding, you know, even Christian colleges will have to have uh, housing uh, for homosexual marriages and different things. And there's just all these pressures and laws that are coming upon our religious freedom. A social media that's drowning us with pure filth and impurity all in the name of freedom. We have movements and parades and all of these things of our freedoms why we're in bondage to sin. What we don't realize is that freedom has its dangers then. We have the freedom in our country to kill unborn children. Freedom that has brought massive re revolt against our police and all authority. And so what is happening in our country is that all of this is leading to a loss of freedom. A free society will always abuse its freedom. Why? Because we're not truly free in the moral sense. Our bondage to sin will always destroy our freedoms because we will never be able to truly love in the bondage of sin that we are in. We will use our freedoms only for ourselves to the harm and to the control of other people. And so there's never going to be a perfect government until Jesus comes back with perfect people on this earth. And so this depravity of man will manifest itself in the freedoms that we have by harming. And so while at this point in time we do have political and societal freedom, the problem with our country and our freedom is that we are not free spiritually. And that is what I would like to look at this morning, is to take a day like tomorrow to give thanks for the freedoms of common grace that we enjoy, but to understand what is true and spiritual and godly freedom. What is the freedom that the sons and daughters of God enjoy? And the reason I want to do this is that the same way I see people abusing the gift of freedom in this country, I see the same abuses going on in the church under the guise of so-called freedom. They've turned their freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. And so I want to define and explain what is biblical freedom. I want to explain the dangers to it and what are the blessings of it. And so we will open up this morning and I want you to celebrate with me the great freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. And so we will uh, open it up. If you'll turn to Galatians chapter 5, we're going to uh, bring our focus there and then we will pray. Galatians 5 verse 1. Paul says it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Let us go before our Lord. Father, we come before you and we acknowledge that we lived in the bondage, Lord. We were tied by three cables, the cable of our own flesh, the cable of the devil, and the cable of this world. And Father, we were in a bondage that you called spiritual death. And your word says, but God, being rich in mercy, with the love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sin, he made us alive together with Christ. Father, we thank you for the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. I thank you that those bonds have been broken. I thank you that we have been set free now to seek and pursue a true righteousness, to pursue to be pleasing to our God. 
God, we are grateful for the freedom that we have. The reason we gather here this morning is because we are free. We are free uh, in, in a country that allows us to gather, but we are free from the bondage and slavery of sin. God, let every heart know this freedom. Let no one walk out of here without it being their Independence Day. God, let all know the declaration of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the freedom that it brings. And so I pray by your spirit, through your word, that you would work in our minds and our hearts. As we just sang, speak to us, O Lord. Speak to us, uh, open this word up, change us, conform us to the image of Christ, and let us stand firm then in our freedom. I pray this in the name of our sweet Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Galatians chapter 5. I want to take a look at Galatians then to work out this principle of freedom. And I desire that this morning that all in this place would find this freedom. And the, and the one who keeps wavering back and forth by subjecting yourself again and again to a yoke of slavery, even as believers. And so getting back in with the old oxen, being unequally yoked, getting back under that I'm going to fulfill the law for my acceptance and approval before God, the beast of burden, to go back under that. I would that all of us would stand firm in our freedom. Just get this settled once and for all. It's easily the single most subject that I counsel on as a pastor. And so let's see if, as Paul says, if we can get it, epithumia, that we can understand our freedom. I am in labor for your freedom this morning, that this would be the church of the free in the truest sense of the word of God. Jesus wants to give you true freedom. He tells us that. And so he is interceding at the throne of grace for our freedom. He desires for us to stand in it. Listen to what Jesus said in John 8. He said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they answered him, we are Abraham's offspring and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you shall become free? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin, a doulos, a bond slave of sin. And the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. If, if therefore the son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. That is what God wants for you, child of God. He has given us a book from cover to cover to find freedom in his son, to find forgiveness and salvation in him alone, to find him, to have an internal inheritance with him. The curse brought bondage. It brought slavery, and in Christ it is fully removed. This freedom is not a carrot on a stick. Some of you believe that. It is not just here, but I'll never ever get it. This is what God wants for you this morning individually. He wants you to have this freedom, and he wants you to stand in it. And that is what Paul is laboring for with these Galatians. They had Christ publicly portrayed before them. They saw the gospel and they believed. God, uh, Paul has shown that God has done all that we need in Christ Jesus through the book of Galatians. It, it, it's finished. It's not by the works of the law, he said, that you'll be just. He has laid out the gospel of grace and its power to sanctify, and we have found great freedom in Galatians. But now the Judaizers come, and they say to these new converts, yeah, but... Sure, Jesus did that, but to really be complete, to not be an Ishmael but an Isaac, you need to be circumcised. That is the way into the covenant people of God. You need circumcision if you want to be in the children of God. They added some other mosaic principles that you need to keep these as well. And to Paul's argument, to Paul's amazement, he's saying, you guys are biting on it. They're adding works to the finished work of Jesus Christ. Jesus plus, Jesus hung on a cross, te telestai, it is finished, the veil's torn in two, I've accomplished the work of redemption. And they're coming and saying, not quite, it's not really te telestai, you need to add your good works to get justified. You need just a little bit of religion, you need to do a little better, be nicer to your wife, attend church on a more regular basis. If you will do these things, then you will be right with your God. And so Paul showed them an allegory in chapter 3 and 4, or chapter 4, where history spoke of this. And he showed the example of Sarah and Hagar, 
uh, Sarah, uh, he tries to, to have a, a child of covenant by the flesh with his maid, Hagar, and Sarah's the one in her barren womb that God came and gave a child. So he said, you can get children by the flesh, or you can have children by believing and trusting in the promises and the finished work of God in Christ Jesus. One represents this one paradigm of works and flesh and self-dependence, and it ends in eternal destruction. And one represents God's children's paradigm of grace. Christ and the cross rest in it, trust, faith that leads to inheritance. There are two realms, Paul says. There's the realm of flesh, and there's the realm of the Holy Spirit. There's the realm of being under law, and there's the realm of being under grace. There's the realm of self-righteousness that you will go work it out And there's the realm of divine righteousness that is a gift of his righteousness given to you by grace through faith. And Paul says you dwell in one or the other. You are in one realm or the other. So unless you are born again, you can't enter into this freedom. It will be Christ plus all of your days. And some of you are sitting here in that bondage. It's Christ plus, I just keep trying to do enough and I live in this bondage where I can never find acceptance and the love and approval of God and I'm weary and I'm heavy laden. And you will always have this nagging feeling, there's just something more I gotta do to have this freedom. I just need to do something more. So in Christ is freedom. In Christ is to live accepted by God, forgiven, declared righteous, Holy Spirit, a new heart with new desires, to live into this new paradigm called children of God. Freedom. Freedom. And my definition of freedom is that you are free for the first time to truly love. You are in bondage all of your days to self-love. And no matter how many commands told you to love, you couldn't do it. And you're just in slavery to this self-love. And the gospel has the power to come and now enslave you to love to God. To love to God and love to others. That's the freedom that has come in the gospel. John Piper said this. What you have when you lack no opportunity, no ability, no desire to do what will make you happiest in a thousand years. You have the freedom to live for eternity. You have the freedom to make choices now that will last eternal. Once you come to Christ and believe this gospel, you are to stand in your freedom, Galatians 5, 1. Stand firm in this freedom. Keep standing firm. I I kept picturing a tug of war. And when, when you're a kid and you're playing a tug of war, when you got in there, you wrap that rope around your waist, your hand, and you would get your feet dug into the sand or wherever you were doing it, and you just, you were ready. And you were ready to fight and to tug and not be pulled over by the other group. And so here it is, is there, there's this flesh wanting to pull you back under law he's talking about. There's a tug of war, and he's saying, you keep standing firm. And do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery Like you have to keep and do these things to be right with God to find acceptance. The heresy that's being sown in the Galatian church. He's saying fight for it. It isn't Jesus plus. It's Christ alone. Finished work. Stand firm in this reality. And so what does this tell you this morning? It tells us that our flesh then is wired to this stuff. Your flesh loves this kind of stuff. We have to fight to stand in this freedom that we have found in Jesus Christ. We have to renew our minds daily in his word. We need fellowship to keep us focused on this truth. We need it preached into our ears again and again. I need to hear gospel. I need a Christ-saturated church so that I don't get drifting back under law. I like what Sean said last week. He said, you take Christ out of this book and it's nothing. It's just a bunch of stories. And you add it, and it comes to life, and it gives freedom to those who come by faith and repentance to Jesus Christ. Don't go back into the realm of unbelief where you made the law a ladder to try to climb your way into heaven. 
When you make your obedience to that law, your ground of acceptance with God, you will kill yourself. If you do good, then God loves me. And if I do bad, then God doesn't love me. That is a horrible way to live your life. Paul and God call it bondage. Do you know this bondage maybe here this morning? Are you living in this bondage of just, I, I, I can't find peace and acceptance. I just, I can't do enough. I keep looking at who I am, what I am. I just can't find freedom. The gospel of Jesus Christ has set us free from such slavery. We are free because we saw in Matthew 5 that Christ Jesus fulfilled the law. He kept it in our place so that now God and man can dwell together in a new covenant, a covenant that he keeps all of the requirements. He gave God the righteousness that he required for us to be in his presence. And by grace, through faith, he gave it to us. He put it to your account this morning, you, if you have faith, you have the righteousness of Christ in your account. That's how God views you when he looks at you positionally. Live into it. In this chapter, Paul deals with the reality of what this truth does to a heart. There's gospel transformation, and that changes from the inside to the outside behavior. And there's moral reformation that changes the outside, but not the inside. And too many sit in the church in bondage week after week, week trying to change the outside when there's nothing of the newness of the regeneration and new birth on the inside. And I just keep all my rules and do everything I'm supposed to do and there's no heart of love, which is the fulfillment of the law. There's no love. And it's just a bunch of rules that you keep and you're just a gnarly dude, lemon-sucking Christian. I heard an illustration of this is, is, I want you to picture a rod of iron. And if it was bent, there's, there's two ways that you could fix it if it was bent. One is just external power. You could grab it and bend it back. Not everybody can do that. Some of you can. You bend it back, and what happens? It's far weaker because the fibers on the inside are broken. The other is you can put it in fire till it glows within, and it's changed on the inside, and then you straighten it, and it's stronger than before, and it's called tempered metal. And that is the gospel, to put your heart in the fire of the one who made you. His purifying fire, the softness and a sweetness that will make you stronger than ever. God is not after nice people, but new people. He's not after better people, but a new kind of people. Guys, the gospel of free grace, it comes into your life and it changes you. And it makes you a godly person that hungers and thirsts after righteousness. It changes you from the inside. And the gospel says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You are, not, you are treated now not on your performance, but on his performance. It's a free gift from God in Christ Jesus. Your purity does not make it more. And so I'm asking you this morning, how does that create a godly life then? How is that going to create a godly life? God loves you no matter what you do. That sounds like freedom to sin, freedom to destroy. That, doesn't, that sounds bad to me. What do unbelievers do with that? In, in Romans 6, Paul said they say, why don't we just sin that grace might abound then? You know, this is great. I can just sin, 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 and, and grace will abound. I love this. And Paul's saying, perish that thought. How can you who died to sin still live in it? And so how does this work? Well, here's an illustration that I shared when I preached through Galatians. As I, I've seen this a lot with the high school kids. And the high school students, their junior year and the first half of their senior year, I've never seen them work harder in my life. I mean, they are just busting their chops to get those ACTs and SATs and grades and to get accepted to college. And then that letter finally comes that says you're accepted to college and their last semester, they don't even go to school. They're lazy, they sleep in. I was like, do you even go to school anymore? And, well, I have one class. And they just, everything just drops dramatically and you say, why? Why? Well, I'm in, I'm accepted, my grades don't mean anything anymore. Isn't that what this gospel's gonna do? How does acceptance give me incentive for discipline and righteousness and love and to seek him over all else? How does that work together? Do we need to say, well, well you need just a balance 
You need a balance of kind of acceptance and your works, and you just keep working together trying to keep that balance. A lot of churches teach that, but that's not, that's not Galatians. Paul is saying it's not a balance, but it's your relationship. The reason you obey is your relationship with God, your free relationship through Jesus Christ. How you got into that relationship is the beauty and the power of a transformed life that will give you freedom and you will be free indeed. You see, the false teachers, they talked about faith, but they differed in why you obey God. They taught that you do it to get in a relationship with God. And Paul said you obey God because you have a relationship with God. That is the difference between slavery and freedom. That's the difference of finding what I'm preaching here this morning. And so Paul is saying that the why then is the crucial issue. The Judaizers say you obey to get God's love. And that's a bondage that will never set you free. Paul says you obey because you have God's love so freely in Christ. And that will give you a freedom now to do what the law has always required. This creates two different kinds of humanities, two different kinds of people and two different religions. And this is so important because this is the key to freedom. Not whether you obey God, but why? Why? Listen to what Paul said in Titus. I'm going to give you a little preview of what's coming as we study through Titus. And this verse is so good, it'll be worth laboring in together. Titus 2.11 For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. What does this do, this grace? This grace doesn't cause licentiousness. This grace causes it, instructs us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Freedom, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us, why? That he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good deeds. There's my freedom. I'm now zealous for good deeds. I'm zealous for righteousness and to obey my God. So why are you saying no? Just say no to drugs. Why do we say no? Because the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men. And I want you to put your name in it, bringing salvation to Ken Murphy. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to me. And to get that in there, when you finally get that, that's your freedom that Paul wants you to stand in. And so Paul's exhortation is don't put a yoke of slavery upon yourself again, child of God justified in his sight. Don't start looking to self and law to get your acceptance. Because you are going to want to do that because of flesh. There is remaining sin in your life, not reigning, that is wired to think this way. And it wants to put you back under what he's exhorting us in Galatians 5.1, to go back under law and to just never ever find peace and freedom in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So keep standing firm. Don't drift from this gospel. Don't go back to trying to merit God's favor with your stuff. Don't mix free grace with your efforts for justification. So full atonement, can it be? Yes. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Full atonement. Here is the gospel of sanctification. Stand firm in your justification and fight for the glory of this name that you love above all names. The freedom to love. And Galatians, as he will write on, he'll say that's the fulfillment of the whole law now. I am free to love. Do you know that freedom? I can't explain it. I've been set free. And I have a love for God that is internal and beautiful and a love for other people that just keeps growing. Do you know that freedom? Or are you just a gnarly, mean, nasty legalist? What are you? What are you? Paul's going to show that there are wrong reasons for moral obedience. And he's going to show three, three wrong ways of thinking in this area in our verse, Galatians 5, 1 <clears throat> through 5. The Judaizers are teaching you need to get circumcised. So you've got to become a Jew to get into this salvation instead of looking to Christ. 
They're teaching that you got to obey Moses in order to get into the kingdom. And thirdly, they say that believing in Christ, it's not enough to make you acceptable. And so this is slavery, moral achievement, so God loves me, personal failure is all it will bring. You're going to be bent back, and you're not going to be heated and changed in the fire of God's love. And so do you see why this is so important? Look with me in verse 2. So verse 1, it was for freedom then that Christ set us free. He wants us free. Therefore, keep standing firm. Get your feet planted. Get get firm in the gospel. And do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Don't put yourself back under Moses. Verse 2, behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. If you get circumcised as a way to get into the people of God to earn his love and his favor, it will profit you nothing. It'll do nothing for you. Christ put an infinite asset in God's bank in glory. It it paid the debt that was owed to God. The wages of sin is death and Jesus Christ paid it. By faith, it is applied to you. So don't take your moral assets and try to pay this debt to get God's love. These little payments that you're trying to give God, you know what they do here? He says they nullify grace. Keep trying to give him your little payments and you're nullifying the grace of God. They are an insult to the Father and to Jesus and to the Spirit. You are insulting Jesus Christ to keep saying, here, you need a little more. Let me give you some of my good stuff, some of my moral things. He says it's an insult to the Spirit of grace. We exalt Christ, grace, and the cross when we recognize that we don't have any assets to invest ourselves. We come poor in spirit with nothing in our hands to cling. That's Christ's asset. The atonement was the full and final payment. Slavery to reject Christ as your only benefactor, to treat him as a banker that needs your assets to pay out dividends, His work on the cross then will profit you nothing. I'm praying this morning that you will have freedom from that thinking and that mindset. Look at verse 3. And I testify again to every man then who receives circumcision that he is under obligation then to keep the whole law. And back in Galatians 3.10, if you're under the law, you are under a curse unless you can perform and keep every detail of what that law required. You're a debtor to the whole law, Paul says. You want to just start keeping a little bit? You're going to be under the whole thing, and you've got to keep it all. Add one thread of your obedience to your acceptance, and you now have to keep the whole thing. You're under a curse then. Your mindset is that of a debtor. And I just, I'm going to keep trying to pay back grace, and I'm going to earn it. I'm going to, just here's, God, you gave me all this, and every day I'm going to keep making a payment to, to you. Grace pays debts, it doesn't incur them. He paid a debt he did not owe because I owed a debt I could not pay. In verse four, therefore you've been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified, declared not guilty, saved. By law, you have fallen from grace. This is an absolutely fatal mistake to turn back to look to law to get you right with God. You're severed from Christ. Add law back in. Look back to flesh to work for this gift and you will sever yourself from Christ. You fall from grace, from freedom back to slavery. Keep standing firm in the gospel of grace. Fight your flesh and the enemy in the world that preaches self. Stand firm in the full acceptance through the rejection of the Son of God. Jesus paid it all, amen? When my kids were toddlers, I would come home and I'd get on the ground and we'd get out all the toys and we would start playing. And at the end of the night, it was just a mess in our living room and it would be time to pick them up. And I could, I could say to Jordan or Josh or here, just Kayla, you know, p- pick, up, pick up all the toys, and, uh, and be done in two minutes and then get in bed. And I can walk away aloof. He was so young, my kids, that they couldn't have got it all figured out. Laura had these little buckets for every toy and everything. These kids could have never got that thing right. 
then they would have fought and been frustrated and, and it just would have exasperated them and they would have failed and they just would have been in bondage. Or I could get down with them and I can make it a game and love him and it becomes a joy to pick it all up. Here, let's have a race. You get all the blue, blue uh, toys, what are they called? Little, oh, I don't remember. My brain's going blank. Just little blocks. How's that? You take the blue blocks, I'll get the red blocks, and we're just going to race, and we'll see whoever wins, you know, gets, gets ice cream or whatever it is. And so now our relationship will turn his obedience into joy. And so the gospel is God was not aloof. He left his throne. He came and he lived and died in our place. He has risen, and he has reconciled us, and he's turned our obedience into joy so that now we live in freedom. We are free to love our God and our fellow man. There's the gospel of Jesus Christ. So in verse 5, for we through the Spirit by faith are waiting for the hope of righteousness. This then is what freedom looks like. We have righteousness. We are justified. The last day judgment is coming. And we're going to stand before the king at judgment. And our final verdict will be announced publicly. Not guilty. And we will be made ethically righteous and not just declarative. At salvation, justification, he declares us not guilty. And now on that last day, we're going to be perfected. We're going to be ethically righteous. And the key, though, is how, do you, how you wait. The Judaizers were waiting for that judgment day as well. But we are called here in this verse to do it through the Spirit. We, we wait for our judgment day that I've been crucified with Christ, he said earlier, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, the life I live in this body. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That is freedom. God has come down. He's gotten inside of us. He turned our obedience into joy with a new heart, and we are now waiting for the culmination of all things. We have this blessed hope. We are waiting, filled with the Spirit, for that day. And so this, this freedom that on the one side is the divine work of Jesus Christ. It's finished, tetelestai. And that the other side of the coin then is by faith, we are waiting. Because my, my son, when I got down, he could have said, I don't need your help, Dad. I, I don't need your help. So you got the divine side, but the human side is faith. And with, so faith is we wait and we hope with absolute certainty in this gospel and you see when you know grace that it is done and God sees you legally the way you will actually be one day when you see him and you shall be like him on the last day. And so we hope there's a day coming when our freedom will never get interrupted with trials, the enemy and flesh and circumstances again. By faith, we are waiting for that day. We live forever. We will live forever in the perfect freedom that we have already tasted in Jesus Christ. That's the blessed hope of the believer. And so the currency of freedom on one side is the grace of God, him on the floor helping us. And on the other side is faith saying, we need you. We rest in your promise. We rest in you to work in us and conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. And guys, here's the result of the whole thing if you'll look with me in verse six. For in Christ Jesus, then, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. It, it really doesn't matter what you do there. That's not the issue. But what matters is faith working through love. The whole gospel, then, is there's your freedom. And as I believe this gospel and stand firm in my freedom and wait for the blessed hope that's coming, for that is laid up for every believer, what will begin to be manifest is I will learn to love God in a million different ways and others in a million different ways as the Spirit of God is working and manifesting in me. And so the freedom is that you can now love. You can love other people. You can, you can, you can love God. Remember the whole Sermon on the Mount was just external religion where they didn't want God. They gave and fasted and prayed and it wasn't for God. And now this new heart, this is what happens. I, I just love God, I want Him. And so here's the new birth. This is it. I, it's faith working through love. It's not all these other external things he's saying that you say you got to do circumcision, you got to do this. What matters is that you believe this gospel and you stand in it. And therefore, it will work itself out now supernaturally to love. 
And some of you, I've said this so many times from this pulpit, but I just, I can't get over it. You have all this doctrine and it's not manifesting itself in love. There's just, there's no way. There's no way. This is what the fruit of our freedom. We're free to love. There's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't change it into anything else. Are you growing in this and manifesting more and more the image of Christ? Are you doing it in your marriages, with your children, with your neighbors, with those you work with? Do you have any unbelievers in your life that you're trying to show them the love of Christ? Just, is this, if I were to ask your spouse, are you growing in the way you love? I, I hope the answer would be, man, you're, you're different. They're, the only thing that can explain you is the Holy Spirit and this gospel. And so I want you to really wrestle, do you have freedom? Do you have the freedom that Paul is talking about in the book of Galatians? Because if you haven't, he holds up Jesus Christ, who today saves people who can't love people who are rebellious to this God and love their own agenda, want to be God. He's just saying, will you repent? And will you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ who breathed his last on a tree, dying in your place and living a life in your place? And now he gives it to you freely for those who will come with nothing in your hands and look only to Jesus Christ. If this gospel has left you in bondage to self, there's a better way and you're not gonna get out of it through the law. You're not gonna get out of it through your church attendance. Look upon Jesus Christ, call upon him and believe and you will be saved and delivered from bondage and you will know the freedom of the sons of God. Spurgeon said, if you have ever done anything right for God to get into heaven, you've never done a single thing for God. If out of fear then, he says, you're doing it for yourself. If you're feeding the hungry and clothing the naked to get God's favor, it's for yourself. You're feeding and clothing yourself. You're using the poor and you're using God. You are not loving them in God. He says the only reason then you can be saved is that God looked at you and was willing to lose his son for you. Not because of what you could give him, but by the free grace of God and his own good pleasure. The one who receives this and believes in it, you now have freedom to do something good. You can do nothing out of love until you know you're a sinner saved by grace. Until you know that, you'll never be able to do it out of true gospel agape love. You have never done anything in freedom all of your days until you see that you are a sinner saved by the free grace of God in Christ Jesus. And so may you celebrate your own personal freedom this holiday, that we have been set free in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And may we keep standing firm in this until he returns. And may we be the church of the free. To God be the glory, amen. Father, we come and we thank you for the gospel of freedom. Lord, I thank you that as we have seen those who have given their lives for the freedom of this country, so Jesus Christ has given his life for the freedom of his citizens. Father, he gave it up, he breathed his last for us. He lived a righteousness that the law required that we could have never done. God, in him, we can have peace with God. We thank you for the new covenant. We thank you that this gospel sets us free not for licentiousness, not for opportunities for the flesh, God, this gospel sets us free to pursue a true, genuine righteousness and relationship with you. And out of that relationship with you, it orders all of our life. And it orders how we treat one another. And so, God, I pray for freedom for those who are here. I pray if there are any unbelievers that need ultimate freedom this morning, God, that you would grant them eyes to call upon and believe upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if there are those who have just drifted, God, they've begun, they didn't even realize that they have been looking to the law again for their acceptance with you. Lord, I pray that you would set them free from that. It's disturbing them, it's stealing assurance, it's, it's not producing love. And I, I pray, God, let them just right here in the quietness of their heart repent before you for looking away from Jesus back to Moses 
God, let, our, let us look only to Christ, and in him we find per- perfect righteousness. In him we find a standard, a higher standard, a standard to be run after with all of our heart and freedom. And so we thank you for freedom to pursue righteousness for truly for the first time. What a gift from God. And so we celebrate and we join in, in oneness here at Southside Bible Church, thanking you for the free gift that has come in Christ Jesus. Lord, let us get our feet planted and stand firm in this free gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's in his precious name that we do pray. Amen.